Well, this morning we're continuing in our study in Mark, and we, um, as we have gone through Mark, we've seen a very clear gospel message, a message that Mark was writing down so that people wouldn't lose track of what it is that they were um, finding so important, that they wouldn't lose track of the gospel, that they wouldn't forget the details. And he wrote the book of Mark in a way that was um, leaving out the frills. There aren't a lot of details, and sometimes I have to point that out to you as we go through Mark. Today we're going to be in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 32, and we're going to go through 45. And we're calling this the quest for the best seats. <laughs> now think about it, if you go to an event, to a football game or a um, play that you're trying to see your kid in, or, or maybe even the beauty shop, you don't want the seat that has the, the springs are all squashed down and isn't going to be comfortable. You don't want the seat that's too high for you and leaves your legs dangling. You don't want the seat that's too low for you. But that's not really the kind of seats we're talking about here. Um, it's a good way to remember this truth, however, that's in Mark chapter 10. So we're going to begin reading in t chapter 10, verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him. Now it's interesting, the twelve, remember, were that close group, the disciples, that Jesus spent the most time with. But there was a whole huge bunch of other people who were constantly following Jesus, didn't want to miss a word that he said. They were people who believed in him and trusted in him just as much as the disciples. And the disciples, as they followed Jesus to Jerusalem, this is the last time out of the three, three and a half years that he was on earth, this was going to be the last time that he gets to Jerusalem. And it's a slow walk. He's not trying to see how fast he can get there. We'll still see there are some stops along the way. But the disciples were amazed. That's what the Bible says. Why do you think they were amazed? Probably that he was so brave and just was bold and knew about his, his mission and that he was heading to Jerusalem where anyone, if he had asked an expert, would have said, avoid Jerusalem. You've made a lot of people mad and that's not going to be a safe place for you to go right now. You should probably stay out there at Bethany or somewhere safe and don't go back to Jerusalem. But he had that sense within him of mission and purpose and he knew just like a homing pigeon or something that's where I need to go next so they were headed to Jerusalem but the people who were not quite as close to him the followers they loved him very much they'd been blessed by his ministry some of them were people who had been healed those people were afraid they were scared for him. They were thinking, do you have any idea what the Romans can do to somebody like you who's caused as much trouble as you have? And you're not going to have any support from those church leaders. They're going to throw you right under the bus. But Jesus, as he headed to Jerusalem, had his mission in mind. And I've called it that general term mission, but it was you. It was me. It was individual people that he was thinking about, and that's why he was willing to take that risk. Mark 33 goes on and he says, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. It seems really incredible, doesn't it, that as he told them that, 
That's the third time in Mark that he had said that. I have them up there. I'm not going to read them all to you, but it's the third time that he's told his disciples, I'm going to be killed. That's my mission. That's why I'm here. And we know that they were not understanding him because of what they say next. But haven't we been blinded to the idea of the cross? I think sometimes when we wear those little crosses around our neck, when we use cross figures in our um, imagery, in our bulletins, in our signs, I think we forget that the cross was a really ugly, cruel, hard thing to bear. And it isn't pretty. It isn't shiny. It isn't um, cleaned up as we experience it. And when I choose to let the voice of the Holy Spirit say to me, something that I should or should not do, and I choose to do it anyway, knowingly, just going right there. I am not really acting as though I understand that Jesus died on the cross for that. That wasn't just some little thing, that that was keeping me away from God. So in verse 35, James and John, absolutely classic, do not get what he said. James and John, the son of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now that sounds like something a four-year-old would say, grandma, I want you to do whatever I ask you. And Dave would say, and you will get it too. <laughs> If you ask grandma, <laughs> yesterday I'm cleaning up after the um, lunch that we had with our family and Elijah comes up to me and says, Grandma, I wanted you to play with me. And I immediately left the leftovers and I went outside and we got the dog on his leash and we walked all around and I ignored everyone and later I thought, hmm. You know, you're just a perfect example, but Jesus, not like the spoiling grandma, does not do what the disciples ask him, but he does ask them for a little more information. He said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Now, what would that mean? To them. It wasn't about my chairs sitting up there. I want a comfortable chair. It means I want position. I want to be close to you in your glory. I want to get some credit for what I've been doing down here with you, living on the ground and not having a good place to sleep, left my family, all that stuff. I, we want to make sure we're the two best ones, right? And they just were in the light of what he had just said, it's hard to believe that they would just bring that up. It's almost like, did you not hear what I just said? You know, were your ears not working? What's the deal? They remained unshaken in their dream that Jesus, the Messiah, was there to make everything that Rome had made wrong right again, that he was there and that he was really going to be in charge and rule and use all that miracle power he had to put things right on the world. And he, they wanted to make sure that they were there in the spotlight. But in light of him just saying, the Son of Man is going to be killed and all that stuff, they did not have a clue, did they? They really didn't. I'm sort of amazed at it. I just think, he just said that and they say, we want to sit on your right and left hand. Um, Matthew, I believe it is, says that they brought their mom with them, you know, for <laughs> some help with this request. And, you know, when you bring your mom with you, um, it's probably, they thought it'd be harder for Jesus to say no to their kind of mom, guilting him into, you know, my son hasn't really been there for me or our family. And, and I, I, you lost, you took both of my sons away from me. And, and I think you want to make sure that they're well rewarded for that. But Jesus um, understood their ignorance. He understood that they were asking out of total misunderstanding of his mission. And he didn't slap them about or say something mean. He understood. And I think that's important. We sometimes worry when we're praying, do we know the right way to pray? Do we know the mind of God? Are we going to pray amiss? 
You know, there are all kinds of things about that, that, that God will give you what you ask for if you're praying according to his will. But I think the important thing is to not worry about, am I praying God's will? But to realize if I'm not, Jesus will understand, and if I'm open to that, he'll correct me. He'll correct my thinking. He'll help me get it right. Now, anything worth questing after, we said this is a quest for the best seats, is, I think, um, worth suffering for and giving things up for. I don't think the disciples had that in mind, though, did they? They were ready for much of what people are ready for today. We see that people are very interested in a gospel that says, if you serve God, everything will go well for you. You'll have plenty of money. You will not be sick. You will not have problems. Your kids will all turn out well. You won't go broke when your retirement account is stolen by someone. God will see you through and you'll be great. That's not the real, really the message of the gospel though, is it? And Jesus said to them, he said, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they actually said, sure, we're able. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I'm baptized, you will be baptized not saying that in a mean way, but, but thinking to them, you think you can handle this, but this is gonna be really tough. We know that James was the first of those disciples to lose his life, that Herod, the same Herod that had John the Baptist's head cut off, that Herod had James killed with a sword. We know that John actually lasted all through um, the um, gospel stories, all that we have as far as history written in the Bible, that he was the last to be killed. But they both suffered greatly. They did not have what the prosperity gospel promises us today. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. Now you might say to James and John and to us today, be careful what you ask for. I often think that when I'm praying, especially when I'm praying for a request that I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about, I haven't spent time praying about it previously, when I get something new right out of the box, like when we have prayer request services, I often get a check in my spirit and I may pray it differently than you ask because the Holy Spirit says that to me regularly be careful what you ask for we often ask for things that we think we want just like James and John wanted to sit next to Jesus and they weren't even close to even understanding that the real spots next to Jesus were those other two crosses you know there were two people crucified next to Jesus and Jesus was going to be lifted up during their time, not on a kingly throne, but on that cross. And there are many things that um, Jesus had already predicted many of them. When he says the cup that I drink, he's not talking about poison grape juice. He's talking about the things that he was going to suffer. When he talks about the baptism he was going to receive, he's not talking about John the Baptist who dunked him under the water. He's talking about the cross. And it wasn't just the cross. It was all that spitting and scorning and mean words and people misunderstanding and the betrayal of his own disciples leaving him at such a time. Like think if you're out on the road and you have a car accident and your friends say, see ya, I hope you do well. You know, I mean, they, he was in a terrible spot and, and they ran for their lives. So when we talk about rejoicing in Christ's suffering, People just kind of eh, plug their ears, forget that. That's not the gospel I signed up for. But Peter, um, in his first book there, said he talked about how the early church felt. And he said, we rejoice as we share in Christ's sufferings. They actually had this sense of they were privileged to be able to suffer for Christ. 
Paul in Romans says that the sufferings of our present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So the reward that James and John were looking for, the sitting in the good seats, they were thinking that was going to happen here on earth for them while Jesus was here. But don't we think a similar thing? Don't we think if we are worshiping God and doing things his way that we will be blessed right here, right now? Don't we say about people who have tragic financial loss or things don't go right for them, their house burns down, they get cancer, don't we say, hmm, I just want to get a little bit away from you because I don't really think you're getting God right. I don't think he would let one of his own suffer in that way. But remember, God is the one who did watch his son um, die on that cross. And our sins completely disqualify us from ever being in the presence of a holy God. We have so much universalism type teaching nowadays where we're hearing things that we know better than to believe, but we get to the point we almost want it to be so. We almost think, well, maybe everybody is just getting to God a different way. And the answer is they are not. They are not. Our sins completely disqualify us. There's no way that we can do anything to get close to God. And Jesus bore in his person on that cross what I should bear. That's what I deserve. That's what you deserve. He did that instead of me as my substitute. And we can say those things in Sunday school, but really most of us don't think we deserve to die on a cross. Really, I kind of don't. I don't even want to die in a nice quick car accident. Just, you know, I'm not ready to die. People don't think, hmm, how would I like to die if I had to do it? You know, we don't like to think about that. We think we'll really probably live a long time, forever, and never have that happen. But Jesus was without sin, no guilt, nothing that he deserved to die for. He did that as our substitute in our place. Mark verse, chapter 10, verse 40 says, Jesus' answer, to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now, there's not a lot of information here, but what this says is that God's plan is already set in place. It's rolling, it's moving, it's going to the detailed point of even the people that will rule and reign with Jesus as his right and left hand guy. It's already been settled. God already knows who that is. That's what that says. And Jesus isn't saying that it's not you, James and John. We know that the disciples are, are greatly honored when we look at um, books of last things like Revelation. We know that the um, the city that's going to come down out of heaven, the new Jerusalem, that the disciples are all honored, that they have special places. So it's not that. It's the idea that we often think, because we're in time, we're linear, just one day after another, that that's how it is for God. Well, let's just see what happens. You know, we don't know. That's not God's way of thinking. Those places are already given out, and it's not for Jesus to change that right then. So he gave his life to satisfy that need for divine justice. A holy God could not just say, no matter how cute you are, no matter how hard you try, a holy God is nothing like Phyllis the grandma who says, okay, let's go play. It's not like that. And it's not that God doesn't love you very much, but he's a holy God and he cannot forgive you without you doing it his way. And people try to get around some of the people I know who don't want to serve God, don't want to say Jesus is the only way. They say, well, what kind of God would require that, would say that his son has to die? What kind of God would say I have to do it his way? Can't he understand there are people in faraway countries who, who don't even get it and have hardly any chance? And the kind of God who does that is a holy God 
who we can trust to always do things right, who does not have favorites that he gives a special deal to. His offer of salvation is the same for everyone. And we don't know all the details of all the different people God has sent to give his message to people, but we do know that God even comes to people who are not yet believers in visions, in dreams, that he directs them when they look at the stars, when they look at creation, that he says, look, I'm real, I'm here, this is who I am. And God can and will speak to anyone. He uses us to witness to people, but that does not say he cannot speak to someone else and help them to see who he is. I think we often, in my prayers, I often, when I'm praying for people who are lost, forget that the Holy Spirit is the one who draws people to God. It's not the clever messenger. It's not the beautiful Christian song. It's, those are things the Holy Spirit uses, but it's the Holy Spirit who draws people to Christ. Mark 10, 41 says, and when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. Can't you imagine? <laughs> you know what those guys said. They're trying to cut a special deal for themselves. They were all jostling for prominence. They all thought they ought to be the first ones. And it would be one thing if we could just say, bad guys, but we still do that today in our worship, in the way our churches are run, in the way Christianity goes, we still are trying to be in the best seat. We don't want to be ignored. We still take offense when someone misses us or doesn't, doesn't remember our name or our special prayer request or our, our dog's name or something. We still think, huh, couldn't have really cared that much. And we still do that when we, when we gossip, when we do the things in the church that really tear it down. It wasn't the last time for someone to say some silly thing like, Jesus, do whatever we ask. Please just bless our special little church the best. Make everybody come here. Those are very selfish, not God-honoring prayers. And, and we still do it today. Now, Jesus did not allow that to fester, did he? he, he the, they were indignant. And he didn't allow it to fester. He immediately set them straight. Verse 42, he called them to him and said, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. What he is talking about is the very thing that you hate, how the Romans treat you. You're trying to set that deal up for yourself. Leadership is not about working your way to the top and bossing everything around and making everyone do it your way and having honor for yourself. Leadership is about working your way to the bottom, he says, and serving others. He says in verses 43 and 44, it won't be that way. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. And he's not just talking about his little disciple group. He's not just talking about the church. He's talking about any time we have human relationships. In a marriage, you will not have a good marriage if you're both trying to see who's first, who's God really um, speaking to the most, who's, who's to be favored. In a family, if you have siblings and cousins and people who are all trying to get grandma or grandpa's favor, you will not have peace. You will not have a loving family. A family that can teach children that um, to serve is the ultimate thing to do, not to be the little shining star who sits there and gets served, but serving is great. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, be the servant. So we need to teach our children the best thing you can do is to be cleaning up the crumbs off the floor and helping with whatever needs to be done. The best thing is not to share your little cute joke or, or show off your new outfit or your best toy or sit there with your video game just texting away your phone. Those are not being a servant. 
The same thing at work, where you work, if you have everyone just vying, someday I'll be the boss and I'll make them do it my way. As a believer, that's not how we're to function at work. We're easily taken advantage of because when we are the servant, that's pure worship going right to the throne of God. To be the servant is what Jesus was showing them. He even said that he had come. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's not asking us to do something he did not do himself. He's not coming up with some amazing thing to say, you do this, it's never been done before, and I'll help you. He did it first himself. When this time of year we think about Christmas and we think about Jesus coming as a baby, think about what he gave up. Now we love babies um, and make over them a big deal, but I doubt any of us would choose to go back. Shar was describing a baby this morning who had a blowout. Well, it's not fun to be a baby and have a blowout. And everyone's, ah, this is icky, and oh dear, and throw them under the tap, and let's get them cleaned off. And Jesus did not come as a baby in a time that they even had running water. Jesus came in a very humble way. Think about it. He allowed himself to be there as that tiny, you couldn't even see it with your naked eye. He allowed himself to come in that way and be that vulnerable, that trusting on that young woman whose body he was living in, that trusting to his mean relatives who were all thinking about, oh, they're not even married yet. Oh, that trusting to the people who thought that precocious little brat, he really thinks he knows something, doesn't he? He's able to memorize scripture better than our teachers of the law. On and on, all the things that he bore for you, that had to get kind of tiresome, don't you think? I just think 30 some years of this and then you're gonna kill me? That was not a good deal. He thought it was a good deal because as he's walking to Jerusalem, through all his disciples arguing and who's the first and who ought to do this and all that stuff. He has set his eye on the cross because of you and because of me. He did that for us. And I have no idea how um, no human that I've ever been exposed to could have even come close. I'm ashamed to say that there are times that I say to God, it's too much. I can't do it. I want to go back to my life. I, wanna, I, just, I just want to be a housewife. I just don't want to have the burden of this. Forget it. It's too much. And, and I cry and I beg and I plead and I get back up in the strength of the Lord. And he says, it's not too much because I am with you. And that God who gives us strength for their day, and your day is different than mine, but there are things that we all hit that we say, it's too much, God. I take it away. I can't do that. We all come to points, even if it's just bad hair days, even if it's just our dog ran away and our kids being naughty. There are, there are days that we just feel like, too much. I can't take this. You said you would not give me more than I can bear. That God came for you and for me as the baby at Christmas. It's not about Christmas trees. It's not about lights. It's not about any of that stuff. It's how God views greatness. God views greatness. The Father looks at the Son and says, well done. And when we are not vying for the best seats, the best seat is wherever God has appointed for you to sit. And your seat might not be the one you would have picked for you. It might not feel very comfortable all the time. You might think God could have picked a warmer seat or a shorter seat or more out of the limelight or a seat that wasn't so painful. Maybe your seat feels like it actually causes your body to hurt. Maybe your seat is one where you feel like I'm not really even ever getting to impact anything. I'm just going through all this work I have to do, God, and I don't feel like anything I do has much effect. It's an insignificant seat. 
It's a seat that um, nobody else would want. But the best seat for us is just as Jesus came as a servant and he did just what he was told to do, just what the Father wanted. That's the best seat. Us trying to get out of that and think, oh, I think this one's more comfortable or I think I could get that one, that's not God. And we really, when we think about it, don't want the seat that we choose. We want the seat God chooses for us.